live. Good morning or uh, good afternoon or good evening, according to the time zone where you guys are at. We are here for a new appointment of a live talk for Journal of Cardiac Surgery. This monthly appointment organized by the Journal of Cardiac Surgery, where we discuss one of the paper of uh, uh, the journal and the current issue. Uh, this uh, uh, month, the paper selected was uh, aortic valve replacement in patients over 60 real world surgical outcomes. Paper written uh, uh, by the most senior author is Narain Morjani from Royal uh, Patworth Hospital, United Kingdom, that is here with us and will be part of the conversation. Uh, together today, we will have uh, Jessica Forcillo from the Center Hospitalier de l'Université du Montréal in Canada, where um, that wrote an excellent uh, discussion on the paper that you will find on Journal of Cardiac Surgery in the current issue. Again, uh, soon after, we will discuss the paper with Francesco Maisano, um, international and uh, well-known uh, cardiothoracic surgeon from the Ospedale San Raffaele in Milano. And uh, together with us, uh, we have Thomas Salerno, Editor-in-Chief of Journal of Cardiac Surgery from University of Miami, Dr. Mario Gaudino, Deputy Editor of Journal of Cardiac Surgery from uh, Cornell University, New York, and uh, Hirbat Ahmed from uh, uh, Yale University in uh, I6, and uh, um, Editor with me of the social uh, media uh, component of Journal of Cardiac Surgery. For everybody who is uh, watching us through the social media, I remind you that you can ask us questions and all of these questions will pop up in my private uh, uh, chat and I will be able to moderate them and uh, re-forward uh, to the audience. I wanted to give the, um, uh, the floor to Dr. Morjani from uh, Royal Pathforth Hospital who was the most senior author of the paper, and he will introduce the paper for us, and he will uh, uh, discuss a little bit the findings of this paper. Thank you, Dr. Morgiani. Uh, Gianluca, first, just to, to thank you and the team for giving us the opportunity to present some of the work we've done, but also the concept that what you've put together here about live debates, um, discussing topical issues in cardiac surgery, I think is, is so important in um, modern day, um, medicine and it's important we have the opportunity to to discuss and debate these different topics um this topic that um, we wrote the article on is obviously very um uh, interesting and uh, controversial actually at the moment there have been a lot of trials recently um that have been moving the bar about which patients should undergo uh, intervention on a phreotic valve disease through surgery or transcatheter techniques and um, as the indications seem to be changing, both from the clinical trials and also the uh, international uh, guidelines, we felt it was important actually to put some real world data out there about what, what happens to patients who undergo surgical aortic valve replacement. So as I'm sure will come out in the discussion later, a lot of the trials focus on um, highly selected patients. These are... Um, industry funded studies with very strict patient selection criteria and so we just wanted to say we're a big with the biggest center in the united kingdom we do a lot of cardiac surgery we do a lot of aortic valve replacements we just wanted to put out some numbers about uh, the outcomes for the patients that we operate on um, so we took um, four years of um, patients that's over a hundred uh, over a thousand patients under aortic valve surgery. And we wanted to just give you some contemporary outcomes of what, what we um, achieved. So of the thousand patients, about 85% were low risk uh, defined by Euroscore 2 of less than four and about 15% greater than uh, Euroscore, uh, Euroscore 4. Um, and these um, gradings are what we looked at some of the outcomes later in the, the, the presentation. So we had about 25, 26% of our patients were of the age group 60 to 70. The majority were between 70 and 80, so 45% of patients, and about 30% of patients were above 80. So the full spectrum of cardiac surgical patients, this uh, manuscript was obviously concentrating on patients over 60. And later on in the study, some of the different outcomes we looked at between the low risk and high risk, as well as the different age groups to give us an idea of which patients we should be looking at. 
and especially related to what the current guidelines are, the, the, the recently published um, AHA and American guidelines. Um, just as a general um, uh, overview of the patients, the, the median uh, Euroscore 2 was 1.6, median age was 75. About 20% of the patients were urgent emergency or salvage. And again, this is important to remember in a lot of the studies that were done, uh, a lot of the prospective randomized studies with their um, selection criteria. This is all patients, urgent, elective, emergency, including endocarditis uh, patients. And again, we didn't have any uh, inclusion exclusion criteria with our patients, just anyone who had isolated AVR during that period. Um, of note, the majority of our patients in our hospital were done through median stenotomy. We've got a, a few a small percentage of patients that are done through less invasive um, techniques. And the majority in this patient cohort had uh, bioprosthesis. Um, Interest, uh, the, some of the outcome measures, which we'll talk about later, how they relate to some of the big prospective randomized studies showed that the stroke uh, outcome uh, was 1.2% in our cohort of patients and the pacemaker rate was 3.6%. And this is really pertinent when we compare it to the surgical arms of the intermediate risk studies, partner two, the um, partner three and uh, the Evolute and Notion studies with the low risk patients. The outcomes of our patients, stroke 1.2%, pacemaker 3.6%. Similarly, mortality, in hospital mortality was just 0.9%. This is in all comer, all patients, emergency, elective, urgent patients. And similarly, our 30 day outcomes uh, uh, mortality was just 1.7%. And in our elective cohort, which is when you look at some of the other studies, the the, the, the low risk patients and the intermediate risk patients, our elective study across the board was 1.1% mortality. Um, similarly, the outcomes after surgery in terms of um, uh, uh, complications, return to theatre uh, rate was about 3.7% consistent with our national average, acute kidney injury of about 20%, AF about th uh, a third or uh, just under 40%, our hospital stay was eight days and our intensive care unit stay and ventilator was 24 hours, so just uh, around one day. Um, to try and put this, uh, these results also in context, we looked at one and two year survival and they were 94% and 92% in our cohort overall. And then again, when comparing with some of the uh, low risk studies that we'll talk about later, it was 96% and 94% survival for uh, one and two years. Um, as part of some of the other studies we've done at our own centre, which is one of the discussions that will come up later when we're trying to discuss surgical AVR with uh, transcatheter techniques, uh, we looked at our um, freedom from structural valve deterioration. There's a lots of lots of published data out there: six percent at ten years, nine percent at fifteen years, and our own data for where we predominantly use the. Um, uh, Carponti Edwards uh, manganese bioprosthesis, we had no structural valve deterioration at five year median survival. So that is the, the outcomes that are out there for TAVI and that is the benchmark, the gold standard that we need to, to compare to. So in summary, I'd just like to, to, to present our data that shows in a high volume UK center, um, we have excellent outcomes and this is what we need to base our discussions on when we talk about some of the prospective randomized studies. And of note, these are superior to the outcomes that are often discussed in the surgical arms of those studies, which I'm sure will be part of the debate that we talk about. So thank you for that opportunity. And as part of this debate, I'll be I'll value the opportunity to answer some questions related to our study. Thank you so much, Dr. Morjani. And this is uh, in name of uh, all of the people involved here today. I want to thank you for the paper, uh, for submitting to Journal of Cardiac Surgery. It's a phenomenal and very well written paper. And we all enjoyed uh, to uh, read it. And uh, uh, Jessica, I, I, you, you were asked to write a, an editorial. It was an excellent editorial on the paper. You are a successful uh, uh, a surgeon involving transcatheter. Uh, and, and in fact, like the, the paper of Dr. Morjani start from a feeling that most of the cardiac surgeons around the world have felt that is the fact that we feel a little bit frustrated by the representation that the uh, low risk uh, uh, TAVR versus SAVR uh, um, trial have given of the surgical art. What was your thinking when you read? What was your editorial? What are your 
taking home message from this paper? Yeah, thank you, Gianluca, and thank you for the invitation. I, I think this uh, conversation is really pertinent. Uh, so, Dr. Morjani, I would like to congratulate you again for this uh, great paper. And this serves as a concrete proof that SEVER remains an excellent option with favorable outcomes in the treatment of aortic stenosis. And what this paper did, it, it to me, it was a wake-up call to the and, and to the entire surgical community uh, to push forward to ameliorate outcome, to improve outcomes and reduce complication through uh, innovation and experience. And I think that the previous uh, randomized trial uh, taught us uh, a great lesson because as you can see, and we're gonna discuss about that, uh, the surgical community uh, changed a little bit their practice. So as you can see in Dr. Morjani paper, the majority of the valve implant was 21, 23, 25. In the partner three trial, uh, it was it was not what is seen in the actual STS registry where 60% of the valve implant were less than 23 or less. A majority of the surgeons were now implanted in 23 and 25. And I think that there is um, a wake up call like we said, and it's important that we continue to improve our results. And another paper that showed that was the commence trial when Dr. Bavaria at the STS this year presented the five-year results. Contemporary data on surgical AVR are, are actually excellent and bigger valve implanted. So we are... Um, we are uh, changing our practice. Uh, we published also a paper from our group in Journal of Cardiac Surgery uh, about the change, the trend of change over time, TAVR and SAVR. And we see that the, the results are actually excellent in the contemporary era as TAVR outcomes are increasing, but also surgical outcomes are increasing. And this is also based on patient selection. And, and I think we're gonna discuss about that. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jessica. And thank you for uh, your, your points that are well taken. Francesco, so it, it's, if it is true that surgeons uh, feel frustrated for the results or the way in which uh, we, uh, uh, surgery has been depicted, has been described by this uh, um, randomized trial uh, uh, industry sponsor that changed the guidelines, on the other side, surgeons are also responsible for the last 30 years uh, for not innovating aortic valve surgery or for uh, not trying to uh, embrace transcatheter uh, and rather trying to be hostile against this technology. What are your thoughts? What you're thinking? What do you think about this new, uh, this, this, the position of Taver and Saver in the current era? Okay, so first of all, we talk a lot about low risk trials and we we should really inform uh, our colleagues that low risk trials are uh, co were conducted in very selected patients and i think uh, instead of talking about low risk trials we should start talking about young patient and old patients to be very honest in the older patient even if a patient is low risk i have a big doubt a huge doubt that in an old patient Saber remains an option. Uh, I think uh, I agree with the current guidelines. I mean, to to expand uh, uh, Taver in uh, older patients with uh, ideal anatomy. I mean, we need to change the paradigm. Rather than uh, being uh, stubborn and say we can do great surgery even if the patient is eighty-five, no comorbidities. I don't. I don't agree with that, and I tell you why. And I tell you from my perspective, which is a perspective of a surgeon who has no bias since uh, probably more than 15 years, I mean, in Tavi and Saber at the same time. <clears throat> the problem is that besides outcomes can be excellent also with surgery, I, I don't disagree with that. Still, uh, Taver is a much easier operation for an uh, uh, older patient. And we know that uh, we don't have to talk only about mortality and PV leak. Uh, I mean, this uh, this for, for sure these are indicators, but think about quality of life. To regain quality of life after, after surgery in an 80 and older years old patient, it takes months, three to six months, which represent, you know, five to 20% of their overall life expectancy. So if I'm older, I don't want to go through a, a, a long time for recovery. So in the, older, in the older population, we should really understand that this is a great solution. As we go younger, 
then we need to be more strict. And the only way to really uh, foster an appropriate approach to, to Saber Tower, uh, the only way is to be part of it, is to be able to, to, uh, to uh, offer this solution to our patients is the way, uh, I mean, as a, as a again, as a, as a, I don't want to be called hybrid because I hate it. I'm not a hybrid surgeon. I am an unbiased surgeon because I have uh, all the spectrum. In my practice, very often I convince my patients that surgery is much better than TAVR. But just because I have no bias and I am very convinced because of that. So in general, uh, I think uh, I, I like the, the point uh, that uh, uh, basically the results are getting better also in surgery. And uh, I think the, the, the low risk trials, the part and two, part and three, have been very important to raise awareness in the surgical community that we need to implant uh, better valves, larger valves. We need to be as much as possible less invasive. We need to be uh, perfect. But still, that doesn't mean that TAVR uh, doesn't play a, a big role and will play more and more in the future in the elderly population. As you go lower with the age, well, I have a lot of doubts. I totally agree with that. Um, for the patient that are 75 and over, I think that TAVR should be the, the way to go uh, if there is no other uh, contraindication. Uh, the challenge will be for the art team, and that's where the implication of cardiac surgeons are really important and relevant, is, is to know uh, which patient would benefit more for the TAVR and which one will be more for, for a TAVR. Excellent point, Francesco. I think uh, age is becoming an element that uh, has to be discussed. And I totally agree with you that like, when you see a patient in, in, uh, soon after a tower, the day after, and is ready to go home, or uh, it's tough to say that in an older or fragile patient, uh, it's not what you want. It, it is what you want. And maybe if we have solid data to prove that uh, the long-term data are the same uh, and we can overcome the, the perivalvular leak or, or the stroke uh, or the, the pacemaker that, uh, and make them to a very, very low rate, we can even extend the indication. On the other side, the American College of Cardiologists in the current guidelines that were just released a couple of months ago have put uh, a very interesting age as class one indication for uh, for TAVR. And uh, I don't I don't want to say because I mean, I am a, I'm a biased surgeon So <laughs> for how much you are unbiased. I'm a biased surgeon. But I was very surprised by reading those uh, guidelines and see that uh, the, uh, there was a class one indication for um, TAVR in patients 65 or older. What is your personal take? Like a patient walk in your clinic, Francesco and Jessica, reply oh, both of you. A patient walk on your clinic is 65 years old. What is where do you where do you drive the conversation? Is low risk? Uh, is like is is still working? Is uh, a professional CEO of a company? Is very busy? Wants to go back home as soon as possible and working as soon as possible? Where do you drive the conversation with him? And what do you try to uh, not convince because you are not trying to convince? But where do you think will will be the best choice for these patients? Jessica, Jessica first. Please, Jessica. Okay, so uh, like like we all said, I'm a biased surgeon, and I think that's really great that I'm involved in both of the procedure. Fifty percent of my practice is TAVR, fifty is surgery. So I think I'm in a good position to um, advise my patient um, um, in the in the proper way. So basically, what is a low risk patient? A true low risk patient is a patient with a low STS or low U score. It's a patient that has no uh, indices of frailty. It's a patient that, had, that lacks any major organ system compromise and has no procedural impediments. If I have doubt, I do not hesitate to ask for a TAVI angioscan prior, even if it is the patient is a little bit younger. Or So this patient needs to uh, fit in this category of low risk, really a low risk patient. Um, I, a lot of patients now are coming to the clinic and they know about TAVI, they, they, they read it on the, the site on the internet. So that's another thing as well. So they can arrive in your clinic with a preference. 
but at some times, but preference, patient preference is supposed to be important. It's important. And I think that we should consider it according to the lifestyle of the patient. And some of the patient also you need to discuss about them because they are ready to take a low risk option in favor uh, or in exchange of less favorable outcomes. So I saw that as well. But you need to um, discuss with the patient and, and influence them in some way about the, the things that are still unknown for a low risk patient, especially 60, 65 years old. And you need also to think ahead of what will be the second procedure, because probably those patients, if you are to up for a biological option, uh, you need to think ahead of what will be the second procedure. And we can also discuss about that. Um, Mechanical valve is still a valuable option, even if the guideline decrease at 50, but I think you should be honest and, and present that option as well. Um, and uh, basically in your head, knowing what's, uh, what's happening with uh, TAVI and what can happen with PPM, PVL, uh, durability, uh, subclinical thrombosis, uh, I think you don't have to expose everything to the patient because I think it's more technical and it's a bit more, um, uh, our stuff, but usually 65 low risk patient, I will advise for a surgical AVR. Uh, and, but we'll truly discuss with the patient about his preference as well, what he knows, what he think, and uh, what he foresee for the future. So, uh, first of all, we need to, uh, I want to tell you one thing. The younger, the youngest tower I did has been 38 years old and this was in the year 2007 so as much as you can imagine i'm a crazy guy but this was a young guy who had a uh, degenerative tissue valve and at that time there was no much experience in valve involved and it was a good idea i mean that just to just to make just to say that you you don't have a recipe that works for everybody you need to be very flexible and there are two con two things I would like to share with you. Number one, no discussion. We live in the era where the patient should take their own decision. Uh, our role is not to decide what to do. Our role is to, uh, to consult them, to share with them all what we know about advantages and disadvantages of all the procedures and uh, let them choose one. It is a little bit complicated sometimes for patients to go through this decision making. But you know, it's just like when you go to the bank and you want to uh, invest your money. The banker will tell you, what do you want to do? You want to go low risk, high risk? Uh, you want to gain more, gain less? It's your decision. It's your life. So when I talk to a patient, I try to tell them all what I know and then I try to ask them what they want unless they ask me to take the decision. Mm -hmm. The second point, which is also very important, is that I am convinced we should move from a, a approach which is uh, photographic. I mean, you take a picture of the patient, you take a decision now, which will last forever. This is a typical surgical. We look at long-term outcomes. We don't care. I don't care about what happens in 20 years. First of all, I need to get to 20 years durability. Durability is an important point but it's not the number one point here. I think, first of all, we need to enter into era of uh, <clears throat> lifetime management. And lifetime management means that any decision you take today will have a consequence not only in 10 years from now, but maybe one year from now. So there are many conditions you need to take in, in consideration. Obviously, if you go younger, uh, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of questions. Uh, will the coronary disease uh, evolve? Uh, will this patient therefore need a PCI, for instance? Uh, will this valve uh, last long enough? Uh, will this, uh, you know, uh, bicuspid valve a problem? Uh, there are a lot of issues, obviously. But again, think about, not don't think only about the long-term outcomes. I give you, I, I tell you this because I was debating maybe two weeks ago uh, with one of my colleagues who is... Uh, a little bit more, let's say, conventional guy who, li who likes to operate uh, 85 years old people with, uh, with uh, uh, a surgical approach. He told me, you see, look at the partner tree trial. 
the two the, the two curves are joining again well yes and maybe there will be a crossover and i and i agree with you that maybe in five years time maybe we'll, we will see that probably there's a little bit of an advantage of dying less in five years time but in the meanwhile you die more at one year time so you know you also need to understand that the risk profile of a procedure has to be seen over time so the concept of lifetime management and the concept of uh, taking the risk that the patient wants to take. Somebody wants to live longer, somebody wants to live now. <laughs> so it's a difficult decision and we need to be very, very well informed. Thank you so much, Francesco. Very excellent point. Very well, very well discussed. Dr. Morjani, you, you, you were the, the source of all of this discussion here today. So tell me about your choices. So a 65 years old comes to your office tomorrow, actually Monday, tomorrow is Sunday. So hope you have one day of rest. So Monday comes to your office and now is, has severe aortic stenosis and uh, a low um, risk uh, for surgery. Is, has the life of uh, each one of us, uh, a wife, a mortgage, a uh, couple of kids. So what do you suggest him for, for, uh, for uh, uh, his choice uh, in terms of a aortic valve? So, so I, sh I share some of the comments of, of what's been said already. I think that the most important, thank you for the day off tomorrow first, just I, I forgot to mention that. Um, I, I think the most important thing is is that the patient is given the right evidence. I mean, we've all talked about the concept of a heart team, the interaction about the patient maybe choosing a, a less invasive um, option, but knowing that what the risks of those are. But I think the issue is that not all patients are given that full understanding of what the different options are and what the implications of those options are. Your um, concept of about life and the whole life journey is a, as important is correct. But we need to inform them of that. So uh, I'm sure you'll all have seen in response to the AHA guidelines that were put out at the end of last year, the Latin American um, Cardiac and Endovascular um, Society put in their statement saying actually they didn't believe in the AHA guidelines. They categorically said all surgical trials are based on surgical risk. Therefore, we cannot have age criteria. Um, they said that all... Um, there is no long prospective randomized study beyond five years. So if a patient is expected to live beyond five years, we should not be advocating to have it. Now, I'm not sure I would go as extreme as that, but there is some merit to the argument or the, the points that they are trying to make. So in answer to your question about the 65-year-old that, that turns up, in my best impression, if the, the, the information I would convey to them about long-term durability, about a valve, the need for another operation, as, as um, Jessica mentioned, the, the concept of mechanical valve is often forgotten about in these discussions. It's just said TAVI or surgery, meaning bioprosthesis and one or the other, you may get structural valve deterioration and need further intervention. So I think the crucial part, part of the whole debate re related to this is about informing the patient properly. And that is where our uh, results come in. And as I said, I, I, I'm involved with our uh, national society and we've got similar uh, data related to that. 31,000 patients over five years, similarly 1.2% um, mortality and stroke rate uh, 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 at, low, uh, at similar rates. So it is important that patients are given this information of durability, of paravalvular leak, of PPM, all of which have impacts on long-term survival, both quantity of life, but also quality of life. So I think these discussions need to be put to the patients of pacemaker, um, patient prosthesis mismatch, paravalvular leak, and the implications it will have if they're left with these potential complications um, after whichever intervention they choose. So they must be given the discussion. In my practice, a majority of them will end up having um, surgery. Thank you. Very well uh, taken points. And uh, um, we will get back again on mechanical valves. I want to talk a little bit about it later on. But right now I want to ask Mario Gaudino uh, and involve him uh, in his Saturday morning in New York City in this conversation. 
So we spoke about uh, randomized control trial and uh, guidelines. So this industry-driven uh, randomized control trial, uh, guidelines uh, that uh, set an age uh, to a different level that most of the cardiac thoracic surgeon has felt in an uncomfortable way. Where are we stand of as surgeons in the decision making of these guidelines? What do you think about these uh, um, ACC guidelines and uh, the uh, Latin American Cardiothoracic Surgical Associations ones? So what is your position taken about that? Well, thank you, De Luca. Um, I think uh, uh, first of all, uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, randomized trial by definition are. Uh, are uh, focused on a, a highly selected cohort of patients where uh, there is, in this case, real equipoise between the two techniques. Uh, this patient population does not represent uh, current practice. And uh, it is the issue with uh, low external validity of uh, RCT. It, has, it is, uh, has always been an issue and it will always be. And this is why a paper like the one that we are discussing today are very important because they also give us a perspective on what happened uh, uh, in the real world the data. On the other hand, uh, I, I am here a little bit uh, 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 taking an unconventional position for a surgeon. I have criticized industry sponsored the trial uh, often. But it is also true that it is the only trial that we have available. And, and, and this is, a, a, to, uh, honestly, it's all of us fault. I mean, industry has a, a lot of uh, 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 problem in the way they design their trial. Don't get me wrong. Generally, people design industry-sponsored trial are among the best uh, trialists in the field. But they are biased, like all of us. And so they tend to design a trial that um, will probably tend to the direction where that they believe is the right direction. Uh, if a surgeon designs a certain trial, would probably design a trial that uh, is likely biased in the opposite direction. This is just a nature, and uh, this is why trial results are just need to be uh, uh, discussed and interpreted. But the reality is that there has been no surgical uh, 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 lead the trial. They have all been in the uh, industry uh, initiated trial. So this is the evidence that we have, and this is that we, the evidence we need to base our guideline on. In general, I don't think, uh, and with all the due respect to the South American society, I don't think that you can disagree with a guideline. I mean, the guideline is, uh, 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 um, or I mean. If you want, you can disagree with all guidelines, but still those are the guidelines. The guidelines are uh, general expert opinion based on uh, uh, evidence, and this is what the AHA ACC guideline is. If you have the different expert, you may have the different opinion, but, but the, this is true for all the guidelines that we have in our world. As a surgeon, honestly, I think we haven't done a great job in providing solid information on uh, surgical AVR. It is true that we have uh, 20 years of data, 30 years of follow-up on our patient, but honestly, they are not great data. They are clinical data in complete follow-up. Uh, um, probably the best longitudinal data that we have from on uh, uh, surgical AVR come from the TAVR uh, trials with, uh, you know, uh, a systematic echo, central core lab. We didn't even know there was subclinical thrombosis before the tower uh, uh, trials uh, came to show us that that was a problem. You think that was not a problem earlier, in our, when we were doing only surgical AVR? Well, I do not think so. So I think that uh, uh, we need to take responsibility for the fact that uh, we haven't been uh, 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 smart in the way we have uh, 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 studied uh, 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 surgical AVR. Uh, we haven't made a lot of uh, progress. Uh, I mean, I think we are doing the AVR the same way we were doing it 50 years ago. And uh, yeah, we have tried the small incision. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, the, 
tower is a real progress. And Francesco has a great point regarding the quality of life. I am, my practice is 95% coronary, so I am in another field. In coronary, uh, if you look at the couch versus PCI comparison, uh, uh, mm, mm, for the full first year, the quality of life of patients who have bypass surgery is lower than the quality of, li of life of patients who have PCI. So if a patient has a three-year life expectancy, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to use an intervention that takes a full year to recovery, especially because of the benefit of surgery are seen in the long-term follow-up, a long-term follow-up that that particular patient is probably not going to reach. So in the end, I am, again, it's not my field, I'm a coronary surgeon, but I think we should be happy that we have the tower option because there are patient that honestly we should not bring to the operating table and having the possibility of treating the uh, aortic uh, valve stenosis with an intervention that is much less invasive it's really really a progress for medicine and for the patient and and yes we should do what francesco is doing being able to master both the technique and provide both option uh, uh, to, to to the patient there is a saying uh, 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 in the United States, the uh, key to long-term uh, success is short-term survival. And so, I mean, this is uh, something that uh, for some patient is, is particularly relevant. And remember, and I will shut down after that, I will shut up after that, but I don't think we should use that, like I have, I have uh, heard several times the same uh, 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 paradigm that we use when we compare CAPG versus PCI, when we compare TAVR and SAVR. When we compare CAPG and the PCI, we have uh, two very different interventions that led to very different anatomic results that uh, have a very different effect on the coronary circulation. When we compare TAVR and SAVR, well, the two interventions, even though very different in terms of uh, 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 trauma to the patient, they end up with a very similar, if not identical, anatomic result. So the comparison is on a totally different level. And having said that, I'm just a coronary surgeon. Thank you for the opportunity. I will be here listening. Thank you, Mario. As, a, as always, despite you are a coronary surgeon, you're, it's an excellent and well-taken point. And I totally agree i think taver made all of us better surgeon and again as i said in the first instance uh, and even jessica said before we are all uh, responsible for the outcome of our patients we are implanting bigger valves we are more careful of our outcomes and it's through taver taver trials made us aware of problems and uh, details that we need to be aware of and it's our responsibility we have not done in the 20 years before so it's a shame on us that we have never anticoagulated or studied the, the thrombotic, the thrombosis on a small annulus valve and uh, try to implement guidelines to anticoagulate uh, uh, small size valves. It's on our end. We have been master of surgical AVR since the 60s. So uh, it's, it's our responsibility. We have not evolved. One question, uh, Dr. Um, Morgiani, what is your... Uh, feeling or your uh, perception in uh, mini in invasive AVR? Where should stand up? Where, do you practice it? It's part of your practice. How many of the patients involved in your, in your uh, paper were part of uh, the minimal, were, were done in a minimal invasive way? Do you think as a role, minimal invasive AVR? Um, so um, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, I do uh, think there is a role. We've, uh, we've evolved in our practice that, uh, in, in the study, a small percentage, so less than 5% of the patients were uh, underwent mini AVR. We use that in our hospital. Um, I think it is an important part of uh, evolving. Um, I think as you commented, I think a lot of surgical practice doesn't necessarily evolve to the rate that it should, and that's for a, a variety of reasons. But um, I think it is important that we offer patients the whole spectrum of, of um opportunities that surgery has to offer and so whether it's through a hemistenotomy whether it's a right anterior thoracotomy whether it's sutureless valves or rapid deployment valves i think there are all 
different uh, gamuts of what we should be offering patients moving forward. So, and especially when we're talking about the concept of how these decisions are being made um, about giving patients the options about shared decision making as, as the main um, tenet that underpins our, our um, interactions with patients. So I think it is very important. Our study did not have a large proportion of it, but that does not mean that I, I don't value the importance of it. And I think for, for patients to have um, the, the full options, it is important to have that within one's practice. So, And I think it will continue to to become a, a larger part of surgical um, uh, aortic valve uh, replacement. I just want to share a comment uh, regarding this that Dr. Lamelas uh, did at the Heart Valve Society. So he said that with the current randomized trial, we're comparing uh, Apple and Origins, uh, comparing TAVI and surgical AVR via sternotomy. So what we should do is to compare mini uh, AVR, either especially the one with right anterior thoracotomy, to actually TAVI to compare apples and apples. That that's a comment that uh, he uh, did, and this uh, this goes in regards to the evolution of, of SAVR and that we were mainly maybe may stagnant at some point, and that we need to um, evaluate. Um, uh, we need to progress towards a more minimally invasive approach as well. Yeah, providing you implant a good valve. Yeah. Very often, yeah. <laughs> when you go minimally invasive, you accept compromises. I think this is a very important point, and we learned very well <clears throat> what that means, uh, particularly in this uh, in this so-called industry-sponsored trials. You know, when I hear this uh, definition, I always shiver because uh, you know industry obviously has a bias, but they have a quality that uh, the non-industry uh, trials are not having, uh, including the, the trial we're talking about today. I mean, uh, excellent trial, excellent uh, registry, retrospective. Uh, you know, we only know the outcome in the patients. You decided to operate. Uh, we don't know what was the, the, you know, what was the characteristic of the low risk trial. So there are a lot of limitations also in the, the publications that we have been producing. The reality is that in a, you know, it, it was an industry sponsor. The part and three was was sponsored by by Edwards, but the surgeons were not paid to be, to make a bad job. So <laughs> at the end of the day, it was an industry sponsored trial that showed that that probably surgeons should do better. And I'm I'm very very skeptical about sutureless valves and other and other tricks. Uh, you know, sutureless valves. In, for instance, I never implant them. I, I let some of my people from my team to do it, and I always have to discuss a lot because, you know, I think they bring the worst of the, of the two scenarios, of the two worlds. Uh, they have uh, a lot of, you know, they have, a, they, they have, they bring other challenges. I think uh, as a surgeon, probably we should be very careful uh, to to embrace new technologies without asking questions. I see sutureless valves being implanted in some centers as a first uh, option for everybody. I see uh, new valves with new tissue, which is uh, supposed to be super durable, which has been given to younger patients without any evidence about that. And we know what we're talking about. So there are a lot of areas where surgeons are actually behaving bipolar. On one side, they say, wow, Tavar, stop it, because the industry is paying. But at the same time, we accept some industry-driven information, and we go, you know, we go outside of the pathway uh, without even asking ourselves where these data are coming from. So I, I think, uh, and again, I would be again debated for that because I'm always considered to be very biased uh, by by industry. But I think you know, don't uh, don't do not forget that industry has been a, a key element in the evolution of cardiac surgery. Uh, without uh, Medtronic, there would be no pacemaker. Without uh, Alberstar and, and Edwards, there would be no buzz and so on. So industry, and, and we need to be very, very strong in, in this debate uh, between industry and non-industry uh, driven studies. But at the same time, uh, we need to have a voice. And I think, honestly, the American Association guidelines, the HAA guidelines are crazy. <laughs> I don't know 
why they took this decision. I mean, this is totally crazy. I don't. I I, I try to understand where they found the the uh, the, uh, the data to support this indication. To be honest, because the yeah. those those trials were were not were not uh, enrolling patients sixty five and older. So again, but, but, but some, so, so some of that discussion comes with actually, which is some of the controversy that came with previous um, guidelines is about who is on these guideline committees. I think you'll have seen, there's a recent publication by Hinton and Benoit Shah in clinical medicine a, a couple of months ago, which showed actually for the European guideline committees, up to 80% 80, 80 of them have a conflict of interest. So they get direct payment from the company, they get their research funded by the company, they have intellectual property with the companies. And so actually the most recent um, guidelines published by the British uh, National Institute of um, Health and Clinical Excellence actually has gone against the standard guidelines for TAVI. Now, you could argue both ways, but they've actually said where surgery is an option, surgery should be uh, performed. It said the cost effectiveness of TAVI does not merit its, its use. So they are looking at it from a different angle. They're looking at individual needs of patients, but also from a population base. And they're trying to look at the cost effectiveness per quality. And they've said, actually, if surgery can be performed in low, intermediate, and high-risk patients, TAVI is not cost-effective. Now, I understand the discussions we put, we all agree about there are merits for them, but it is understanding that actually some of the guideline committees, um, individuals do have a conflict of interest. In that same Hinton paper, they looked at two hematology guideline committees, one where conflicts of interest were not allowed on those um, within the committee and those that were, and they came up with completely different guidelines. So we need to also be aware of the people that are writing the guidelines that it is, I think uh, you said right at the start, we all have innate biases within us. We all have prejudices and ideas of what should and shouldn't be. And so it is actually sometimes very difficult to move away from those um, um, innate unconscious biases that you can't, cannot change. And maybe the one way to change that is as the National Institute of um, Health and Clinical Excellence did. They excluded anyone with any potential conflict of bias before the guideline committee was constructed and therefore the guidelines were made. Yeah, can I, can I add something on that? I, I mean, this is not as simple, even though your point is very well taken, but it's not that simple. I see two main problems. First of all, uh, uh, probably, uh, uh, among uh, uh, those who have uh, most knowledge and content expertise uh, have a relationship with the industry just because they are more active on the research side and so they get in touch with the industry. So if you just uh, have a blanket uh, 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 rule that nobody with conflict of interest should be allowed in a guideline, you may risk uh, cutting off uh, uh, the best of us those who have more knowledge, uh, and I don't have any conflict of interest, just to make clear, but uh, uh, so I'm not advocating uh, uh, for this reason, but I think uh, this is something that you need to consider. I mean, if, you have, if your focus is mainly clinical practice, you don't do a lot of uh, clinical research, so you are unlikely to have a conflict of interest. Uh, if you have devoted all your career to clinical research, you probably at some point uh, I've worked with industry, I would prefer the second guy to be on the guideline, not the first guy. So that's, uh, that's uh, uh, one point. But also, uh, 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 I, I don't think that the conflict of interest are necessarily only uh, uh, financial in nature. I think the strongest conflict of interest uh, may be actually non-financial, maybe related to what you do uh, uh, every day and what to probably drive not only your salary but also your uh, 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 scientific uh, 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 reputation, your visibility. So I, I, I get your point but the solution I think it's much more complex than just uh, looking at the uh, relation with industry. And don't forget that those who have, who have uh, less the many of those who are not declaring conflicts, they have a lot of conflicts which are hidden. Uh, particularly in the in the in the medical guidelines, you know, in in the 
many, many committees. There's a lot of problems with, with that. And I think, uh, you know, I can't agree more with, uh, with Mario. There is a lot of discussion to eliminate every, everyone with a conflict from, of interest from the guidelines. On the other hand, if you do like that, you will have probably less competent people around the table. Uh, the other point about the NICE, I, I totally agree with you that, that uh, health technology assessment is a great way to uh, value <clears throat> a procedure. And I, I totally agree with you that uh, we should uh, have a, a social look at, uh, uh, let's say, uh, these procedures and, and, and sustainability. And the problem is, is it sustainable? Uh, and there are many ways to be sustainable. I, I tell you one example. I just came back from, uh, from uh, uh, Switzerland and went to Italy, and specifically to Milano. Let me tell you the story. I'm uh, very much uh, informed about access of therapy uh, within Europe. Uh, Europe uh, has a diverse situation where if you live in Germany or Switzerland, uh, everyone gets very high, uh, uh, highly technological treatments, you know, new treatments, a lot of TAVIs, a lot of uh, uh, mitochondria, whatever. If you live in uh, uh, Eastern Europe or in Albania, Greece, you will probably not get much less of that because there is no money. Italy is in the middle. Then I went to Milano and I found out that most of the procedures are not reimbursed by the, uh, the government, the regional government. And the answer to that is that, you know, uh, to reduce the risk of uh, non-appropriate uh, uh, use of these devices, uh, they lowered the reimbursement. So for instance, for a bad involved in the mitral position, you get a reimbursement of 5,000 euros against the a cost of the device, which is uh, between 15 and 20,000. So in principle, if we go down into uh, economics, uh, there is another risk that we also lose the, uh, the center point, which is at the end of the, the good for the patients. And again, uh, the, the quality, uh, the cost of quality, uh, or let's say the, the, the health technology assessment highly depends on the cost of the devices. As you move forward, the cost of the device will be reduced. Today, yes, a coronary stent is sold for peanuts. It was uh, 6,000 only uh, five years time, or maybe 10, 10 years time, 10 years ago in Europe, you would uh, pay three, 4,000 for a stent. Today is less than 100. So everything moves, and, and, and the economic back, and the financial background of decisions is also another uh, misleading factor. Thank you so much. Thank you for everyone. I think it's an excellent uh, question. I want to ask uh, Irbats, uh, who is uh, here with us uh, from the I6 program of Yale. Give us some perspective. You're a young surgeon. You are training yourself right now. What's a, a young surgeon perspective of all of this discussion? Where do you see yourself? AVR, surgical AVR, TAVR. Do you, do, where do you think you want to train? Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, my comment is actually in the form of a question. Uh, <laughs> it's what should be the approach for young trainees like myself and others who are presently training in different cardiac surgery programs around the world. And it, I, as I was um, just about to say this, there is a comment here that says it's hard for surgeons in developing countries to have training and availability for TAVR. Um, that is one of the considerations here. And also we spoke about SAVR being stagnant over the last 50 years, not having improved much. Where do you see improvement in, TAVR, in SAVR? How can it be improved? Uh, how can we incorporate it in our training? Should, we, uh, should all trainees aim to dedicate a proportion of their training to TAVR? Um, or should it be a super specialty? Um, these are some questions that um, I have seen frequently and they come to my mind naturally as a trainee. And if you can also comment on uh, how SAVR as, as researchers and future um, 
scientists, what can we do to improve SAVR? Um, if we can comment on this, please. Um, if I, thank you for your question. If I can comment, um, we, we uh, wrote a paper with, uh, it was leaded with Tom Nguyen, who were a young surgeons and uh, mentored by a um, more experienced surgeon. So uh, what came out from this paper is it's for sure, it's now very important that every surgeons to, um, to continue to leverage their knowledge and experience treating valvular disease and obtain the necessary skill set to achieve um, and participate in structural heart disease. The greatest obstacle that I could see right now for the surgeon, young surgeons that are already in practice or, or for current surgeons is to access to a formalized uh, structural training. And I think that uh, for the young surgeons uh, who wants to do TAVR, I think that the option is to uh, go in a formalized uh, one-year fellowship to obtain that, just to have the recognition from the cardiologist. Because a cardiologist, other than that, another obstacle is that they don't see an incentive to have a surgeon doing the procedure. They want you to be involved in the uh, decision process and everything, but when it's time for the procedure, uh, they, they, you're going to be either the surgical backup or you're going to be the second assist uh, or you're going to be the assistant. Um, so it's really important uh, that young trainees be involved in those uh, training. Uh, we start in Montreal to do a rotation, a three months rotation as an introductory to structural heart disease for our uh, resident. Uh, at some point, if some are interested, they would have to do a formalized training. Other than that, for surgeons that are currently in practice, it, will it be proctorship in different hospital to go with a surgeon that are already doing this and to have a certification to do TAVR? Um, but I think it's really important to, to be involved and to stay relevant in that field. If I can give you an, uh, an advice, forget about what you do, it's not important. You know, how you do it, uh, you know, today we talk about tower, maybe in uh, 10 years time when you will be busy, there will be wireless uh, uh, implantation, I don't know, whatever. So the problem is, in my opinion, the main reason why surgery became uh, in, uh, cornerized or became a little bit less uh, influent in, uh, in, the, in the current cardiovascular scenario is because unfortunately many surgeons became a little bit uh, lazy and uh, forgot that before being a surgeon you need to be also a cardiologist you need to understand the disease you need to know everything around that disease so when you ask me what is the future what should i do uh, to be successful i don't know that's that's your life my life has been already is already behind and your life is in, is in front of you and uh, you need to be ready to adapt to the changes that will happen again. There will be another change soon. We don't know where. And the only way to resist to the change, or let's say to, to survive the change, is to change your mindset from skills to, to competence. I you know, in my team, I don't want I don't need people with skills. I don't need that. I mean, every, everyone who has a skill can be uh, replaced. I can teach the skill to somebody else. To, to, uh, to build your competence, it's a lifetime. And so competence, in my opinion, will keep you busy for the rest of your life. Which, what, what that means, I give you my example, for instance. You know, I made a career, I think a pretty good career, because I made a decision. One day I said, okay, stop. I want to learn tower, yes. I want to learn my tech, yes. But I will stop trying to go to 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 uh, to progress my surgical skills outside of valvular disease. That was a decision, difficult decision, because I was a I was as every surgeon trying every day to do something new, a little bit of Occam, a little bit of uh, uh, coronaries, arch surgery, this that, blah blah blah, robotic. Stop it. So I focus on one topic, and, and the focus means you need to be inside of the pathway, of, uh, inside of patient pathways and, and play a major role, not only because you can use a knife or a catheter, but because you understand that each step of the decision making, uh, you understand the process and you have a, an insightful, uh, 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 let's say, role uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this pathway. 
Thank you. These were fantastic, Francesco. I put your change your mindset from skills to competence as a baseline of our because it was a very good. Uh, Narain, please, a very brief comment, uh, and then uh, we will ask a final comment from Thomas. Uh, Narain, what is your suggestion for young surgeons? I, I think it follows on from um, the, the, the last comment. It's about um, being inspired and see the journey um, forward. It's, it's easy to talk about some of the um, processes that have happened already, but medicine, surgery, treatment of cardiological disease will evolve rapidly, and you need to be a big player in that. Uh, learning wire skills, I'm sure, is useful as a, as a basis of, of a start, but I think it's thinking broader and bigger than that. You want to be able to drive the change on how you feel, or how patients can best be treated. And I think, um, yeah, I think be inspired would be my um, suggestion to you. And um, yeah, the, the, uh, open up the different horizons and the, the, the world is your oyster. So um, good luck on it. Thank you. Thank you, Noreen. It was a great discussion and great uh, paper and uh, great comments. Thomas Salerno, Professor Salerno, a word of wisdom from the editor-in-chief of Journal of Cardiac Surgery. And you, you have seen a lot. Uh, tell us what is your perspective about TAVR, SAVR, present and future perspective. First of all, thank you all for this fantastic discussion. I think you gave a very real world view of where we are in this field. For those of us who live through this, and you perhaps could read the article I wrote in the 80s in CTSnet called In My Opinion, in which I was pleading with cardiac surgeons to get out of the operating room and get involved into percutaneous and other procedures. At that time, was primarily endovascular stenting. was actually being done by neurosurgeons and radiology, not by cardiac surgeons. So I always ask the question, and something that a young generation looking to the future should ask is, who should have been at the end of that catheter? And I don't have to give you the answer, but we did not have the vision of where this field was going to go. I watched Grunzig give his lecture in, in, in Vancouver, and the cardiac surgeons did not believe this is gonna be successful to put the balloon to a coronary artery. And to their surprise, there was a lot of uh, um, stent, uh, stenosis, however, came the stent. And basically, you look at the evolution of PCI uh, over treatment of coronary artery disease. And the other thing is, I think I'll remember when Cribier put his percutaneous valve, um, I never thought it would, 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 would work. If, you look, if surgeons see this valve calcified and compared to a radiologist who just see a picture or a cardiologist who just see a pictures, and it, it basically changed our field. And uh, all you have to do is the number of tavers and the number of savers in any center. And the fact is primarily in the United States that we do not see patients. The decision, I mean, we are totally involved, which is making the decision for, and then the procedure is majority done by cardiologists. So they see the patients and uh, also for, even for cardiac surgeons, it's eye opening to see a patient post tower in the morning. They're ready to go home. I mean, by the way, I just want to clarify what minimally invasive is. Invasiveness, according to Calafiore and me in the meeting in Rio in the 90s, is the use of the heart-lung machine. This is not minimally invasive. This is cosmetic aortic valve. Invasiveness, you still put the patient on pump, you clamp the aorta, cardioplegia. Obviously, there are benefits. I'm not saying there are, but the patients get an idea that this is really minimal. It is not minimally invasive. This is actually maximally invasive through a small incision. For those watching this program, reflect on this. Some car majority of cardiac surgeons are flying propeller planes. We're now flying supersonic jets. We're going to Mars to the moon, and we're still doing surgery the way that we did in the 80s. When you, look, when you look to the future, we're in the first, second, third generation of percutaneous devices. This is not going to quit. The investment, I was looking the other day at the investment by industry in research for cardiology and cardiac surgery. They're all in cardiology. Industry investment is in cardiologists. What can, we need to get involved into this field. Someone, somebody thinks that the train has left the station. 
well, maybe we can still catch the last wagon. I wish I were I was born today. So I want to give those in training a view of the future, that this is the opportunity for getting involved in this fantastic field because we can all be participants. The dog is uh, is uh, is agreeing. Yeah, <laughs> for, for, for everybody to, to know, the dog, the dog, Tom Salerno dog is officially part of the Journal of Cardiac Surgery, so <laughs> you, can, you can bark all the time. The dog was the right hand, Thomas. I, I had to mute because they're all barking, but I, I really enjoy very much participating in this meeting. I really want to thank you all for the outstanding discussion. We really, I really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salerdo. Thank you, Dr. Gaudino, Dr. Morjali, Dr. Forcillo, Dr. Maizano, and Gianluca. Thank you, everyone in the audience as well. Um, we are a bit over time, um, but just before ending this, I would like to remind everyone that uh, there is a special issue on aortic surgery now on Journal of Cardiac Surgery. Please check it out and um, it's got a lot of content that should benefit everyone uh, in aortic surgery as well as car all cardiac surgeons. Um, with that, I will thank everyone again, and we will be back next month with another issue of the live talk. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank yeah. you for the opportunity to talk about our paper, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you all.